Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey, uh, hi. Let's go. The original link to the video, top of the description. Um, I need a haircut. I need a haircut really bad. Not now. Uh, Palace of Fran Palaces of France receives Europe travel guide. The original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Click on it, send you right over there. Love to have you. My name's Connor. I like to watch things and learn. Let's go. Museum fills a 19th century. The Jacquemart Andre Museum fills a 19th century mansion, offering the public a rare aristocratic open house. Edouard Andre and his wife, Nellie Jacquemart, spent their lives and fortune designing, building, and decorating this incredible mansion. I'm enjoying a tour by one of the museum's fine guides, Kiera. Because, you know, they had no children, they had a lot of money, and they used to travel a lot, and then they bring many souvenirs. I love the French accent. It's so great. French is just such a beautiful sounding language. Money, and they used to travel a lot, and then they bring many souvenirs. So these are souvenirs from Exactly. Their... What is this? That's the music room. You can almost imagine the clatter of jewelry mixing with the chamber music as Edward and Nelly threw a party. This is the Italian. Exactly, because they travel in Italy and they love Italian arts. And they brought paintings of Bellini, Botticelli, Mantegna, Carpaccio. And Tiepolo, whose fresco graces the mansion's lobby. And this is the bedroom. So that Monsieur and Madame lived here. Yes, but this was the room of Madame, chambre of Madame. Oh, they had two different bedrooms. Exactly. That's Nelly Jacquemart. <laughs> and this was Edward's bedroom, complete with a deluxe bathroom. Down a dreamy tree-lined road, there's another palace, which was actually the inspiration of Versailles. This is the ravishing Vole Vicomte. With an unrivaled harmony of architecture, interior XIV, decor, and up. garden design, it gets my vote for the most beautiful chateau oh. in all of France. Set in a huge forest with magnificent gardens, Volevic Guys, I noticed driving through France, there are chateaus, and then there are chateaus. Like, like, like this, and then there are other, like there are great big mansions are surrounded by like wine fields, and they'll have the chateau, uh, you know, sign and everything but then there's this set in a huge forest with magnificent gardens vola vicomte is an absolute joy to tour compared to versailles it's more intimate and comes with a fraction of the crowds take a stroll over the ornamental moat admire the elegance and symmetry of the ensemble The gardens stretch far beyond the palace, but their main axis runs straight through its center. In this, the cutting edge of sculpted French formal gardens, the landscaper integrated ponds, shrubbery, and trees in a style that would be copied in palaces all over Europe. This was the home of Nicolas Fouquet, France's finance minister during that over-the-top reign of Louis XIV in the 17th century. It all came together when he hired France's top architect, landscaper, and decorator, a trio known as the Brotherhood of Genius. With both a blank slate and a blank check, Fouquet's dream team made his audacious vision a reality. An intriguing part of your visit. Imagine, you know, being an architect or landscape or, you know, whatever expert in that at the time and being given a blank check, even though it's not, you know, it's not for you, but the fact that you get to direct people to build whatever the most lavish thing you can think of must have been such a thrill for them to do. It's a chance to climb through the attic for a peek at the timbers and the structure of the roof. Then you reach the cupa and cap your visit with a commanding cupa. view and a chance to survey Fouquet's domain. The Chateau of Chenonceau is the toast of the Loire. This 16th century Renaissance palace arches gracefully over the Cher River. 
Its formal garden, combined with the delightful riverside setting, makes it one of the great sights in all of Europe. The palace is lovingly maintained, with bouquets of fresh flowers adding fragrance and an included audio guide, making sure visitors understand what they're looking at. Big fireplaces, warmed big beds, while portraits of illustrious owners give the place a certain pedigree. There he is. While the tapestries kept the rooms cozy, they also functioned to depict recent history, to the king's liking, of course. These 16th century tapestries are among the finest in France. Chenonceau was the first great pleasure palace. With its ravishing grand gallery spanning the river, it was designed for high society. Nicknamed the Chateau of the Ladies, Chenonceau housed many famous women over the centuries. In 1547, King Henry II gave the original castle to his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. She added an arched bridge over the river. When the king died, his wife, the queen, Catherine de Medici, took over the chateau. She threw out the mistress, turned Diane's bridge into a fancy ballroom, and according to legend, put her own portrait above the fireplace in her rival's bedroom. Big personalities like kings tickled more than one tiara at a time. Mistresses were a routine part of the mix. Louis XV decorated this palace with a painting of the Three Graces featuring his three favorite mistresses. Now that's the arrogance of power. A powerful queen or mistress often managed to get her own private palace, even when the king's romantic interests shifted elsewhere. In many cases, the king or nobleman would be away on work or at war for years at a time, leaving home improvement decisions up to the lady of the chateau who had an unlimited budget. Chambord is the granddaddy of the Loire chateaus. Far bigger than your average Loire castle, it has 440 rooms you and a fireplace this. for every day of the year. It's surrounded by Europe's largest enclosed forest. 365 fireplaces. It's a game preserve defined by a 20 mile long wall and still home to wild deer and boar. Exploring the vast domain by rental bike, you can imagine royal hunting parties chasing their prey. Chambord began as a simple hunting lodge for bored nobles and eventually became a monument to the royal sport and duty of hunting. Of course, when it comes to hunting, good horsemanship is an Okay, there's no way there are 365. He was just kind of exaggerating. ...of hunting. Of course, when it comes to hunting, good horsemanship is an important life skill. Fabio? Throughout the region, it's not uncommon to see horses prancing and dancing. Starting in 1519, the French King Francis I had this royal retreat built, employing 1,800 workmen for 15 years. Francois Premier was an absolute monarch, with the emphasis on absolute. In 32 years of rule, he never once called the Estates General. That's the rudimentary parliament of old regime France into session. This immense hunting palace was another way to show off his power. The architectural plan of the chateau was modeled after an Italian church. It feels designed as a place to worship royalty. This castle, built while the Pope was erecting a new St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, was like a secular rival to the Vatican. Like a cross crowns a great church, the tip top of the tallest tower here is capped with the fleur de lis, symbol of the French monarchy. Each floor of the main structure is the same. Four equal arms of a cross branching off of a monumental staircase, which leads up to a cupola. Grand opera hunting parties were held under these fine barrel vaulted ceilings. Constructed for Francois Premier, his emblem, the salamander, is everywhere. The hunting theme carries on throughout the palace. This room features paintings and trophies from Chambord's illustrious hunting past. Typical of royal chateaus, this palace was rarely used. Back then, any king had to be on the road a lot to effectively exercise his power. That's why he'd have lots of royal palaces, and they sat empty most of the time. 
Back in the 1600s, Louis XIV spent a fortune renovating this place, and he visited only six times. Touring the lavish apartments of various kings and queens, you notice everything inside was designed to be easily dismantled and moved with the royal entourage. Because French kings moved around a lot, the entire court and its trappings had to be mobile. A royal chateau would sit cold and empty for 11 months out of the year, and then suddenly spring to life when the king came to town. Imagine the royal roadies setting up a kingly room like this, busily hanging tapestries, assembling beds, busily hanging tapestries, assembling beds, unfolding chairs, wrestling big trunks with handles just before the arrival of the royal entourage. The French word for furniture, mobier, literally means mobile. The fancy spiral staircase continues to Is the chamber, the French word for room. Question. The rooftop terrace, decorated by a pincushion of spires and chimneys. Shame From bail. here, ladies could scan the estate grounds, enjoying the spectacle of their ego-pumping men out hunting. One of the most fascinating is Fontainebleau. When it comes to showing the sweep of French history, this chateau is unrivaled among French palaces. Sounds While familiar. home to many kings through the ages, today with its iconic and sweeping staircase, it's the domain of tourists. The palace is richly decorated in royal and imperial symbolism, and its walls are hung with exquisite tapestries. As you stroll, you can enjoy the artistic shift in styles. There's stately renaissance, such as this fine hall, which dates from 1528. Overseen by King Francis I, it inspired other royal galleries, including the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. The opulent ballroom, which hosted many royal parties, is Baroque. In the royal apartments, these ceilings come with the giddy extravagance of Rococo. And finally, there's the more sober, post-revolutionary neoclassical. The decor of this stately library dates from the 19th century. It seems every king, queen, and emperor since has loved this palace. Louis XIII was born here. Louis XV was married here. And after the anti-monarchy chaos of the French Revolution, Napoleon reigned as emperor right here. Fontainebleau has more Napoleon Bonaparte there connections than any other palace with his personal apartments and an adjacent museum. Napoleon's throne room is the only French throne room that survives with its original furniture. You'll see where the emperor slept, the oversized desk where he worked, and the little table where he abdicated. Grand paintings portray the emperor and his first wife, Josephine, after their coronation. Rooms are decorated in the Empire style. She was the daughter of Francis, right, of, of Austria? Wife, Josephine, after their coronation. Rooms are Something. decorated in the Empire style of the Napoleonic age. I could be wrong there. A tent-like room is dedicated to Napoleon at war with his small but iconic battle coat and hat. Field is that his real? With his is that his? Age. A tent-like room is dedicated to Napoleon at war with his small but iconic battle coat and hat. Give me that hat. Field cot and first class camp gear. Napoleon aspired to create his own family dynasty. To turn his Corsican blood blue, he married a Habsburg. His second wife, Empress Maria Louise, provided what he called a royal womb. The hallway is lined with busts and portraits of the sprawling imperial family Napoleon created. Relatives, he put on various thrones all across his empire. It's fascinating to consider the mix of ideals, charisma, and megalomania that shaped the emperor. This revolutionary hero came out of a movement that killed off the old regime, only to create a new old regime. All this royal, noble, and imperial extravagance and the resulting political upheaval is not necessarily a bad thing. I see it as the growing pains of democracy. It's instructive to ponder these symbols of excess, once so out of reach, and today, the playground of the public. 
Why are today's French so hell-bent on defending their civil liberties? Perhaps it has something to do with their heritage of overcoming abusive power to earn their freedom. Hmm. Fantastic. Would love to go there. Um, very much so, especially Fontainebleau. Fontainebleau. Sorry, Napoleon. Hope you guys are all doing well. Um, and I'm going to keep uh, reacting to stuff, all right? Appreciate, I would really appreciate any comments, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye, guys.